Thank you, sir. Um, to, to my esteemed panel, uh, my thesis advisor, Dr. Ariel Blanco, uh, my thesis reader, Dr. Silito Magadia from the School of Statistics, and the uh, panel chair, Assistant Professor uh, Edgardo Makatulad, uh, to our guest here. Um, magandang hapon po sa ating lahat. My name is Ben. I'm an MS Geomatics Engineering student majoring in Geoinformatics. And I will be defending my thesis proposal, mapping the geography of the University Athletics Association of the Philippines Men's Basketball Tournament, Season 81. Uh, a brief outline of my presentation this afternoon. I will first uh, go over what the research is about, why it's important, uh, the research problems that I want to address, and the research objectives that I want to achieve. I will then present some related literature, specifically about the spatial characterization of, of shooting or field goals, and the different spatial metrics that are being used to analyze shooting. Afterwards, I will discuss my proposed methodology, my expected results, and the remaining work schedule that I have. So let's, uh, let me talk about the research first. The, the very first question that probably comes to mind to, uh, when people ask or when I tell people about uh, what I'm doing is why I chose basketball. Where does spatial fit in basketball and where does basketball fit in spatial? The first reason is actually quite simple. Basketball is spatial. In any event that happens during a basketball game, a made shot, a missed shot, a rebound, there is always some form of spatial or even spatiotemporal information embedded in that event. And we can even argue that location plays a key role in, in the occurrence of said event. And this is why it makes sense to analyze basketball from a spatial perspective. More so when we talk about shooting, because players shoot differently at different locations on the court. And this difference has uh, significant repercussions on, on how we rate players, how we consider them as good or bad shooters, and how teams create strategies. When we say that, for example, player A shoots 50% from the field, while player B shoots 40% from the field, Although it seems like we're talking about the same field, which is the basketball court, we probably aren't pertaining to the same field in reality because the players, player A and player B, may not be shooting from the same locations on the court. Direct comparisons of their shooting rates or their field goal percentage, which is just the number of makes over the number of attempts, would lead us to believe that player A is the better shooter than player B. But in the case where player A only takes two pointers from inside the paint close to the basket and player B takes three pointers far away from the basket, player B actually scores more efficiently than player A, 1.2 points per attempt over 1.0 for player A. And although these more advanced statistics like points per attempt, effective field goal percentage, and true shooting percentage account for the difference in points, um, inherent in two-point shots, three-point shots, and field goals, they still do not account for the difference in points scored due to where players take shots. And in general, the conventional statistics used in the Philippines to measure shooting ability and performance oftentimes fail to incorporate, incorporate the effects of location and the spatial nature of the act. For example, how do we define a good shooter? That is a very basic question in, in basketball. Is it someone who simply makes high percentage of his shots, say a center or power forward, a big man dominating the paint? Is it someone who can make shots far away from the basket, or like a three-point specialist? Or is it someone who is a threat anywhere on the court, even though he might not be you know, an overall good shooter? So when answering this question using conventional statistics like field goal percentage, three-point percentage, points per attempt, they provide generalized version of a player's scoring and shooting ability. But as mentioned previously, they don't provide context as to the locations where players shoot and how well they shoot at these locations. 
this is actually quite disappointing because if you think about it, being able to pinpoint on the court where a player is good at, where a player takes and makes shots, is a very powerful tool to have when you're creating basketball strategies and game plans. Um, recently, I ran a simple survey where I asked respondents to actually choose who they thought was the best shooter among three players. The catch here was they weren't explicitly told that they were actually selecting from the same three players in all of the questions. And in each of the questions, only some parts of the information were, were shown to them. So in the first question, they were just given names of players. These are all um, UAAP players from season 81 who played for the UP Fighting Maroons. In the second, they were shown field goal information or the shots that were taken, made, and the percentage that was made for, for each of those three players. And in the third question, they were uh, shown uh, three-point information. So I'm actually currently running another survey that has a fourth question, which shows all the statistics below. But since uh, the results there aren't complete yet, uh, let's first see the interesting outcomes of this, you know, this first survey. The first thing that actually pops up is that the respondents rarely selected the same player for all three questions. In fact, 32 out of 82 of them actually selected a different player for each of the questions. They, they couldn't make up their mind based on the, the information um, presented to them. They were consistent though in choosing uh, the player with the best percentage as the best shooter. So more than 90% of the time, they selected the best, the player with the best field goal percentage in question two. So that was Bright Aquete. And they selected the player with the best three-point uh, percentage in question three, uh, which is Juan Gomez de Leano. Even though, again, these were two different players. Bright was almost always selected as the best shooter for question two, as I mentioned. And this was the case with uh, Juan as well in, in question three, uh, as shown in, in the chart there. But an interesting observation is that uh, Paul Desiderio, um, was selected 25 times just from name alone. Uh, when, when people are given just a list of names of those three uh, players, 25, 25 of them selected Paul. But he was not selected more than five times when the statistics were the information shown to the respondents. This is probably a testament to the effect that reputation and name recall has when, when people assess players. It's also worth noting that a lot of the respondents chose someone who can make a percentage of his shots from different areas on the court as their definition of a good shooter. This can also be the reason why Bright, even though he was, statistically speaking, the best shooter among them, uh, wasn't chosen as the best shooter for questions one and three. He had no three-point game to speak of. As you can see from the statistics, he didn't make any three-pointers. And if you look at the distribution of his field goals from the map that uh, I created, most of his shots, the ones in blue, were actually from, from close range. So even though he had the best metrics among the players in all, all but three points, Sean and Sreli chose Bright uh, as their best shooter in questions one and three. Now, these comparisons were for different kinds of players using the conventional statistics that we have. How would these same conventional statistics hold if we are comparing similar players? So I did the same. Uh, here I had Paul Desiderio, Dave Aldefonso, and Sean Manganti, players of UP, NU, and Adamson respectively in season 81. And if you look at their stats, they were practically the same players. So you, they had the same, almost a similar numbers of field goal attempts, similar shooting percentages, statistics across the board when it comes to shooting were similar for, for all of them. So you might be led to believe that they shoot the same way. But if we actually map the field goals of these three similar players, uh, in this case, I did, the, I did a very basic K-means clustering to find clusters in their uh, shooting distribution. There are some nuances there that are not readily apparent from conventional statistics. 
uh, if you look at the distribution, Paul's is fairly symmetrical. Uh, Dave has a cluster of shots near the basket. And uh, Sean uh, has this somewhat of a left-right cluster for his shots in the paint, showing that they have different habits of shooting, even though if you look at these conventional statistics alone, it seems like they all shoot you know, the same way. Which leads me to the next reason. The, the current methods that we use in the country for accounting for the spatial nature of shooting are oftentimes limited and arbitrary. In the Philippine setting, the most common techniques for showing this shooting ability are shot charts in figure three and shooting zones in figure four. Shot charts are simply point location maps showing uh, where shots are made and whether they were, uh, where shots are taken and whether they were made. But beyond that, they provide little analytical value. Shooting zones add more information. They can show you not just where shots are taken, but also the percentages people uh, have in that zone. But the way the court is divided for analysis is often arbitrary. If you look at different uh, leagues, if you look at different um, uh, even games, they divide the court sometimes differently when they look at shooting zones. So the example here is just one way to divide the court. And we need better spatial analysis tools that, that provide more insight and also that are not so arbitrary. Because we Filipinos love basketball. Uh, that's the fifth reason. There's no two ways about it. You know? uh, I've not done the math, but I feel like we have more basketball courts than hospitals, probably. And most of those basketballs could be something similar to the image in the middle, just makeshift uh, rings and rims in, in barangays and barrios. You know, it's part of our culture. Rafe Bartholomew even had, you know, he even has a book about it, Pacific Rims. And, and while we may never wow you know, uh, other countries with our height, the Pinoy brand of basketball has never been about height. You know, it, it's always, if you're a fan, you know that it's always been about heart. It's always been about puso. And in my own little way, uh, through this research, I'd like to give back, you know, or I'd like to give a bit of utak, add a bit of utak to that puso. And, and who knows, spatial analytics just might give us the competitive edge and advantage that we need to win. So given all those reasons, uh, what now? Well, for me, the next step would be to create better ways to analyze field goal shooting in the Philippines, especially uh, no, methods that incorporate the spatial aspect of shooting. And this brings us to, this actually brings us to the research. Um, the research proposes better methods and metrics for, for analyzing and describing the geography of field goals in, in the UAAP by utilizing spatial analysis and spatial concepts. This idea isn't particularly new. Over the past decade, there's been a rise in the use of analytics, specifically spatial analytics in basketball leagues overseas. This is especially true for leagues that have player tracking systems that can extract an enormous amount of spatial and spatial, spatial temporal information from basketball games. Something like the NBA with their sports view player tracking system. In fact, using those spatial data sets from sports view, uh, Dr. Kirk Goldsberry was actually able to tell the story about how you know, the era or the, the changing of the era in, in the NBA occurred or how it has changed through visual and spatial analytics in his book, Sprawl Ball. So we know that the research can be done. Um, the question now is, can it be done uh, in the Philippines or in the Philippine context? To do that, we would need to address two problems in this research. The first one deals with the characterization of shooting. You know, we want to know how we can divide the court and identify shooting zones in a way that's not arbitrary. So for example, we have a set of field goals, or field goal locations. Can we use that to, to actually divide the court empirically? And the second one deals with the analysis of shooting, specifically one that incorporates the spatial aspect of the act. So for this one, we want to know how do we actually describe what a good shooter is spatially? You know, um, can we identify these good shooters and where do these good or bad shooters commonly shoot from? 
in order to address those those problems, uh, we set some research objectives that we would like to achieve. The first one is basically to spatially characterize and visualize the field goals in the UAAP, focusing on season 81. We'll do this by mapping the shooting and scoring geography. So mapping the shots. Um, we're, we will be determining the parts that make up the field goal geography. So breaking down, um, breaking down the field goal data into interpretable parts. And also grouping sim similar players based on their shooting habits and tendencies on the court. The second one is we want to generate spatial metrics for analyzing shooting tendencies and abilities. So we want to show spatial metrics that can be used to assess a player, how well he shoots and how well he scores, metrics that can be used to compare players uh, with the rest of the league or among similar types of players, and metrics that can be used to rank these players um, uh, as to their shooting or scoring ability. And lastly, I would also like to create and share an open spatial data set of field goals so that others can build on it and maybe, hopefully, use it for their own researches in the future as well. Um, and with that, let's try to take a look at how these kinds of researches are currently being done or how they were done before. The first question is, has this been done uh, in the Philippines? One example that I could give is actually uh, my undergraduate research back in 2014 uh, with my thesis partner, Nico. Uh, we created Court Vision PH. It was a system that could extract field goal locations from broadcast basketball videos and also perform spatial analysis on the extracted data. Uh, so we could perform analysis by distance. We computed for the spread and range metrics. Uh, metrics that were introduced by Dr. Goldsberry, and we were also able to create maps based on the data that we were able to extract. Back then, there were no readily available shot location data, thus the need for the extraction part. So we had to extract the data from the videos. Since that time, the number of researches and studies applying spatial analysis in basketball have grown. No. If you look for it online, especially if you look at um, the MIT Sports Loan Analytics Conference, there's been quite a number of researches and studies focusing on the spatial analysis of sports and basketball in particular. Albeit, these researches and studies were not done in the Philippine context. However, this current research, this one um, that, that, that I will be doing, seeks to apply no, some of these metrics and algorithms previously done in other researches abroad on Philippine basketball. By, by doing so, we, I would like to build on what was done in Court Vision PH and hopefully inspire others as well to add to the growing body of research of spatial analysis of basketball and even the spatial analysis of sports in the country. With that, let's talk about the the different um, objectives that I want and how they were they're currently being done. So let's talk about the spatial characterization of field goals. In the geospatial field, you can find several methods if you want to find patterns in data sets, right? So we can do some clustering, such as k-means uh, clustering, or we can also do matrix decomposition algorithms like principal component analysis, singular value decomposition, and even non-negative matrix factorization. As mentioned previously, uh, when it comes to dividing the court into parts in, in basketball, the, the most common way is to just divide it arbitrarily. You, know, um, you choose how to divide depending on how you think or ec probably expert opinion on how the court should be divided. Uh, when this is done though, the resulting shows do not necessarily correspond to actual areas where shots are taken based on your actual field goal data. Recently, to, to remedy this, the process of non-negative matrix factorization or NMF has found use in determining the spatial basis vectors um, using field goal intensity surfaces. So let's talk about NMF or non-negative matrix factorization. It's a uh, it's a matrix decomposition algorithm 
with whose results exhibit a parts based decomposition it's it's very interpretable and the uh, outputs or the components usually refer to frequently occurring patterns in the sample it became popular uh, in its use to find basis vectors of human faces in the work of Lian Xiong. Um, there they were able to show the advantages of using NMF over other matrix decomposition algorithms if you want to really find um, disjoint and interpretable parts from your, from your data set. Another advantage of using NMF and matrix decomposition algorithms in, in general is the ability to reconstruct the original samples. So talking about advantages, um, in the case of field goals in basketball, NMF is able to decompose the field goal matrix into two components, W and B, which I'll, I'll show later on, uh, that actually correspond to um, two intuitive things in basketball. The first one are shooting areas on the court, and the second one are the weights indicating how frequently a player shoots from, from a shooting area. So this decomposition, as I mentioned, uh, results in two intuitive components that can be used to recreate the individual field goal surfaces of players. Th that is the main advantage of NMF over other clustering, algor uh, clustering algorithm like K-means. NMF also holds a very distinct advantage over uh, other matrix decomposition algorithms like PCA when it comes to dividing the court into shooting areas because one, uh, NMF forces all values to be non-negative and that makes sense in basketball. The second one is the output of NMF is always, for, for, the, for, the, for the context of basketball, always more interpretable than PCA. Um, PCA uh, being unconstrained, it's possible to have negative in intensity values and sub-intensities. So this results in uh, a cancellation phenomenon wherein you can have two bases showing the same areas, one positive and one negative, which makes it almost you know, impossible to use or interpret as a parts-based decomposition of the basketball court. So why it makes sense uh, why in using NMF in basketball, as I've said, the intensity surface of field goals will always be non-negative. It's impossible to have negative number of shots in an area. Zero is the, the least you can, you can have, meaning no one takes a shot there. Um, so the constraint of NMF of being non-negative will always be true in, in the case of basketball field goals. As mentioned again, the output matrices of the decomposition lead to intuitive uh, parts which correspond with basketball concepts. H can represent shooting zones and W can represent shooting tendencies. How do we actually do it in how do we actually do NMF in in basketball? We first discretize the court using any regular tessellation. Uh, for example, grids and shooting cells. And then we fit an, an intensity surface of the field goals in that discretized court. In this case, the, in our intensity is the number of field goal attempts. We can then generate a field goal matrix using these inter intensity surfaces. So how we do that? First, we get the, the intensity surface as a matrix, and then we convert it into uh, a row matrix, basically an array. Um, and then we stack those arrays together to create our field goal matrix V, wherein each row of the matrix would correspond to uh, one player's intensity surface, and each column on the matrix would correspond to one shooting cell. We then use, um, and then we then compute uh, the optimization problem of NMF V equals WH. So. V equals WH or V equals WB, um, as it is known in, in other literature, wherein you know, V is our main field goal matrix, as discussed earlier. It's just the stacked uh, matrix of uh, field goal arrays for each player. The resulting W is the individual player weights and spatial vectors. We can we can look at it as corresponding to the frequency by which a player takes a shot. Uh, 
at that player uh, spatial basis. W are the spatial basis vectors, and they can be interpreted as corresponding to shooting areas on the court. And B, the small letter B, is, is the number of bases or the matrix rank. How, how has it been used in, in different researches in basketball? The first one um, I'd like to show is the, the work by Miller. Um, here, they utilized LGCP to model the surface intensities. Um, so they modeled the surface, surface intensities as a log Gaussian Cox process. Um, and then they com compared, actually, the several methods of, of um, getting spatial basis vectors. Uh, they applied NMF using a uh, KL-based or a kullback liebler loss function. Um, they had one using Frobenius. They also did one using discrete uh, cells, uh, unsmoothed or without using LGCP. And then they also used uh, um, PCA on the LGCP smoothed out surfaces. Their main um, findings were the, the outcomes, the basis from a KL-based decomposition provides a more spatially diverse basis. So if you actually compare uh, A and B, you see that A using um, kullback liebler has a more diverse set of bases than B using Frobenius, where it is a bit more biased towards areas near the basket. And in the same, um, in the same comparison, you can see how PCA, although it's the most colorful, is actually uninterpretable as intensity functions. So when you, vis when you inspect it visually, the corner three-point feature that is uh, re easily, readily apparent from, from, from NMF exists in multiple areas in PCA, some being positive and some being negative. This is an example of that cancellation effect or cancellation pheno phenomenon I mentioned earlier that uh, NMF specifically tries to avoid. Meanwhile, the specific basis weights, the W, um, can provide a concise characterization of player offensive habits. So in, in, in table, in figure nine, in, in that table, we see um, the different spatial basis vectors and the weights or basically the frequency by which players take shots at these basis vectors. So we can actually interpret that as the amount of shots that the player takes for, for spatial basis vector K, for example. And that is very useful if you want to find similar players or if you want to assess where players take their shots. The second one is by Franks in 2015. This is very similar to, very similar to Miller's. They also used LGCP to, to model the surface intensities. They also used KL, um, loss function, uh, but they just, they had only six bases for this one. Um, and for them, they discarded one because unlike PCA, NMF is not mean-centered. So they will always be a residual basis regardless of the value of the number, the value of the number of bases that you that you will you will look for. So in effect, the, this this residual basis is something that captures positive intensities outside of the current support of the other bases. So what they did was actually they 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 discarded that instead of using it, they only used the five um, relevant bases for their for their study. And in their study, they um, utilize spatial basis vectors to model shooting frequency, uh, shooting ability, and also defensive ability. And then we have uh, Zhao. He all, in, the difference in Zhao is that instead of using LGCP, he opted for uh, he opted for a simple kernel density estimate, so KDE, uh, arguing that it's easier to compute and at the same time more accurate. Than, than actually using LGCP. He also had 10 uh, bases uh, in his study and utilized the resulting spatial basis vectors to model uh, shooting 
using mark point processes and uh, covariate analysis. In in these three cases, in all in those three cases that I mentioned, the uh, some of, you can you notice that one had ten bases, another had six, the other one had ten. Uh, the way that they chose the bases, and I'll I'll show some other ways uh, later on, was that they look for how well the NMF reconstructed the the original sample if they removed a certain part of that sample. So they tried to look at how 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 well or they tried to look at the predictive ability of of NMF at different values of B or a different number of bases. Then we go towards the spatial metrics of shooting. Uh, how, how, how is it being done? How has it been done? There are three main ways or three main um, areas of concern or study that we can look at here. The first one is a direct assessment of players, depending on where they shoot on the court. The second one is more about the modeling of estimated and actual points. Um, considering the field goal distribution of players. And the last one is actually um, looking at the problem as a resource allocation, an optimal allocation problem, where you have a, you have a, the, you have a finite number of field goals and you would want to optimize the distribution of those field goals. So again, I'll show one, one example for each and briefly discuss them. Um, for the first one, um, the work of Dr. Kirk Goldsberry way back in 2012, probably one of the most uh, influential and popular uh, studies in this field. There, he wanted to answer the question, the very basic question, who was the best shooter in the NBA? Uh, he argued that conventional metrics and evaluative approaches failed to provide a simple answer. Again, because they don't consider the spatial nature of shooting. He found that if you actually divide the court uh, into 1,284 unique shooting cells, these same shooting cells accommodate 98% of all the field goals taken. He uh, introduced two spatial metrics, which at that time were, were, were advanced, were, were ahead of its time. A spread, which is simply the count of the number of unique shooting cells where a player has attempted at least one field goal basically accounting for where a player will take a shot and then spread and then range, which is a count of the number of shooting cells where a player scores or averages one point per attempt, basically where um, a player is good at. Again, this was almost a decade ago. Um, back then, spread and range were, were, as I've mentioned, ahead of its time. But looking at it now, the, there's a problem with how range was uh, quantified because in a sense, it's also arbitrary. By choosing, by choosing one point per attempt uh, all across the, the, the court, you're assuming that the actual field goal or point per attempt geography is flat. When in reality, the field goal geography of, of basketball in any basketball league is um, more of more like hills and valleys and, and trenches. So you have areas where people generally shoot better and you have areas where people generally you know, shoot worse. So um, that's one of the limitations of, of spread and range, of, especially of range when it comes to, to analyzing players, which is why uh, this study by Shortridge in 2014 is, is, is very important or is, is very interesting. Um, for two things. The first one is they adopted an empirical base rate estimator for field goal rate instead of just computing the rates themselves. They did this um, because they, well, they didn't know the positional accuracy of, of the field goals that they had. So uh, smoothing it out would, would lend to uh, better results. And also um, the the raw rates usually fail to to show the probably the actual rates in areas where there are a small number of sample sizes or where field goals are infrequently taken. 
um, when they performed their EB estimate of field goal rate, it actually resu resulted, as you can see in figure 13, in a more smooth, um, somewhat symmetrical, somewhat symmetrical map of, of field goal percentage. They then used this uh, EB estimated field goal rate to model expected points scored. So instead of instead of of using a single value like one point per attempt as they did in range, they will now use this expected uh, points that they computed as the means for comparison. So they introduced two spatial metrics, spatial shooting effectiveness, SSE, which is the difference in uh, between a player's expected and actual points per shot, and uh, points over league average or POLA, which is just the number of points from field goals uh, that a player scores relative to the number of points that he is expected to score. So instead of, again, comparing it to a single value, they're actually now comparing it to to league average or to what is expected of the player considering the spatial aspect or the spatial nature of his field goals. Because as I've mentioned, the, the field goal geography is almost always never flat. You can always find places where people score more and places where people score less. And then the third way of, or the third way to look at um, studying field goals is by the an optimality analysis, similar to what Sandholz did. Here, they also used NMF to divide the court into, into shooting zones. But the analysis they did was, for each shooting zone, they wanted to rank um, a player's ability in terms of how well they shoot at that zone. And then they compared the actual performance of a five-man lineup versus the optimal performance that they should have um, using a metric they introduced, which is lineup points lost. The idea in LPL is that um, if you want to optimize scoring, then your best shooter at special basis A should be the one to take shots at special basis A. It's not supposed to be the other way around, that your worst shooter at special basis A should take the most shots at special basis A. So they optimized uh, that distribution and um, came up with the optimal number of points, the expected number of points that a five-man lineup would score if they always followed that, that rule, that if player X is the best shooter at, play, at spatial basis A, it will always be player X who takes the shots. And then they compare that to the actual points scored by these lineups. And the difference is the metric lineup points lost. They found that LPL actually relates quite well with offensive production. So a team that minimizes LPL usually scores more. But they found instances where it's not always the best decision to minimize LPL. In, in particular, um, clutch situations, the last 10 seconds, the last 5 seconds, where sometimes it's very difficult to make sure that the best player at this pace will take the shot. And with that, um, with those um, researches before, uh, let's go to what this research is proposing to do in terms of its methodology. First, I'd like to discuss the, the extent of the research, the scope, and its delimitation. We will only look at field goals from the elimination round of UAP MBT season 81. The source of the data will be FIBA Live stat shot charts available online. And the corresponding information include the location, the points, um, whether it was made or not, player, team and opponent information, date and venue, as well as shot types. Free throws and uh, missed field goals due to fouls will not be considered. Um, that information is not found in, in the, the source of data. At the same time, we'll only be looking at location as the primary variable uh, for modeling shooting tendency and, and ability. Of course, there are other ways to do this. As, as I've shown in Zhao, he was using um, mark point processes and covariate analysis. But in this case, we, we will only focus on location 
other con- contextual information or covariates that may affect shooting will not be included. But uh, hopefully further in the future, someone would, especially in researches such as you know, hierarchical uh, models of shooting. Um, with that, let's, let's talk about the data. Um, the good news is the shot chart data are actually available online, as I've mentioned. It's in that URL, and that's how it looks like uh, in figure 16. The bad news is that the formatting of the data isn't really particularly suitable for the research as is. So it's in HTML, as you can see in figure 17, and the field goal locations cover the whole court. And for our purposes, the study for the purposes of this research, we need to map the, the shots to just a single half court. Another problem or issue is that we don't actually know the game IDs of the UAP MBT games. They're not um, continuous. Well, they are, they are the, the first game will always have a smaller game ID than the second game, but it's not like um, first game has game ID 1, second game has game ID 2. So we did not know from the start the game IDs of the UAP MBT games and um, similar to the problem in the, the, that shorted adjust, we did not know the positional accuracy of the field goal locations. They were not given in, in the data set. To, to remedy this, what I, what I plan to do and what I did um, was to create a scraper and parser uh, in Python that first looks for game IDs of each UAP Season 81 game. So I did... Uh, uh, a uh, bit of a hack in a sense that if I knew um, a game ID, I would look above it and below it until I found other game IDs. So the idea there is if the game ID exists, the, the response of the browser would be uh, expected. It would, it would load a specific um, web page. And if it loads that specific web page, then I extract the information from that web page and transform it into you know, a single half port. If it doesn't, it results in a page not found error, it just skips it. So after that, I save the data CSV in order to be able to actually use it in other applications like R, or Python, and most JS applications. The data is actually readily now available. I've, I've uh, shared it online on my GitHub. Uh, it's, uh, it includes both the raw and clean data set. Uh, clean because there were instances in, in the data where there were problems with names uh, in, of the players. So the raw data had some issues with player names. I had to clean that up as well. Uh, the data set includes 7,619 field goal attempts over 55 games. There's one missing game, the very first game for that season. I look and look and it, I, it I, I really couldn't find it. So I had 55 games, one missing game, UP versus UE, uh, and 120 plus players. The image here in figure 19 just shows a sample of the field goals for field goal data set that I have. So for the spatial characterization of field goals, uh, as I mentioned, I'll be using NMF. Um, to do that, I'll find spatial basis vectors. So if I have a field goal attempt data set, I can generate ray intensity grids from that data set. And each intensity grid, I'll convert into a row matrix, and then I'll stack them so that I can generate my field goal matrix V. Once I have that V, I will uh, perform non-negative matrix factorization by uh, solving the optimization problem V equals WH or V equals WB. Again, the H corresponds to shooting areas, W corresponds to shooting frequency. The, the main, um, the, the difficult part here is determining the, you know, the value of the optimal number of bases. So in this case, um, there are several methods. One method I'm currently looking at is, is the elbow method. So I'll be um, minimizing the uh, within sum of squares by looking at uh, clustering and different values of the number of clusters and then find the find the elbow which is 
probably the optimal number of clusters in the in the data set and then use that as um, as the value of number of bases for my spatial basis vectors. Another one I'm also looking at is the one that was used by 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 the, the studies that I mentioned in the literature wherein they uh, tested for the predictive ability of of NMF by withholding a certain amount or certain number of, of data from the data set using NMF on that uh, on that data that, that has information withheld and then um, analyzing if um, how well the predictive ability of of NMF at that specific number of bases is. So those are two things that I'm 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 look I'm looking at and currently uh, trying to see if there are significant differences in both. With with NMF, we can also group and find clusters of sem similar players using their tendencies. Again, uh, as I as I've previously mentioned, the W the W component are individual player you know weights which correspond to their tendencies to shoot at the spatial basis vectors and using that value you can also perform your own you know clustering and grouping uh, finding similar players based on those shooting habits or shooting frequencies and then the the second part of of the research deals with the spatial analysis of shooting the, the first thing I'd be doing is using empirical base estimation to better you know, estimate scoring. So in, in Shortridge, they used field goal percentage. They estimated field goal percentage. In, in my study, I'll be estimating points per attempt. Um, the reasons for which I'll discuss a bit later. Um, but the flow is the same. You discretize the court into shooting cells. In, in my case, that would be 50 centimeters by 50 centimeters. You can compute for the raw points per attempt for each cell given by equation one. So it's just points over the number of field goal attempts in the cell. And then you can compute for the empirical base estimate um, for, each, uh, for each cell. The prior distribution that we'll be looking at is a five by five grid uh, or basically something that is to around two meters from uh, one meter one meter away from the cell of interest and uh, cells that are equidistant to the basket so that that um those cells are our prior distribution or basically our neighborhood cells um to compute for the eb estimate of the ppa we need both the prior mean and, of course, the prior variance. And these are given by equation three, 2 and equation and equation 3. So the prior mean is simply just the, the PPA over the entire neighborhood. And then the prior variance is, uh, again, given by equation 3. We just need the number of shots taken and, and all in the neighborhood, as well as the sample mean for, for the neighborhood. Using those two, we can compute for the weighting factor W. Uh, it is uh, used to shrink the contribution of the prior mean for each cell i. If W is close to 1, our rate will be similar to the raw rate. If W is close to 0, our rate will match that of our Bayesian local average. Um, locations with relatively small number of attempts will have small weights. Um, so again, this results in smoothing out the, the these... The, these these areas where it, they might not be well estimated because of the the low number of of samples in them uh, areas with with low variance will also have small weights so once we have that weight we just um, compute for the eb estimate theta i theta hat i um, using a weighted combination of the local ppa and the uh, bayesian uh, local average or PPA. Once we have uh, that Bayesian PPA, and all this can be done either in Python and R, we can now compute for the expected points and local shooting metrics. Um, so we'll be computing two. These are uh, similar to to the 
to the computations done by Shortridge in their um, in their paper on SSE and POLA. The difference is that instead of again instead of using field goal percentage, I'm using PPA as my uh, as the main um, component. So expected local points is just the number of points that player K is expected to score from a shooting cell I. So it's just the estimated PPA or the EB PPA multiplied by the number of shots taken. So if he actually shoots as expected, this will be the number of points that he should that he should score at that cell or at that spot. And then we have LPPA, which is the local points per attempt. This is just an the disaggregated version of PPA. Basically, we're computing for PPA for an individual cell. Using these three um, values, the EB estimated PPA, uh, expected local points, and LPPA, we can then compute for spatial shooting effectiveness. So SSE is essentially a measure of how much a player is scoring per attempt versus how much he is expected to score given the spatial distribution of his field goals. So it indicates the difference between a player's expected and actual points per attempt. Positive values uh, indicate that the player is scoring more effectively than expected. And of course, negative values indicate the opposite, that the player is scoring less effectively than expected. SSE can be computed globally. Uh, this results in a single number that actually summarizes a player shooting performance, again, based on the spatial distribution of his field goals. Um, and it can also be computed on a per cell or local basis. These per cell pixel values can be mapped and show the spatial distribution of SSE. To compute for SSE, first we must have, uh, we compute for EPPA, the expected PPA of the player. So basically it's a summary value of how easy or how difficult a player's shooting constellation or field goal spatial distribution is. So a player with high EPPA means they're taking shots at places that are uh, on average easy to convert. So these are you know, good, probably good quality shots, shots where most players normally make, um, make them. Uh, a low EPPA, meanwhile, means that uh, the player is taking shots at areas that, on average, um, is hard to convert shots from. So it, it might mean that he's forcing shots or he's being forced to take shots uh, that are bad. Um, so EPPA itself also has value in terms of analyzing shooting. Um, using EPPA, once we have EPPA, we just need to uh, subtract it from PPA to get the global SSE. So Again, SSE just tells us the difference between the expected points and the actual uh, points scored by the player. So PPA can be computed from equation nine and also similar to equation one. And then we have um, the local SSE, LSSE, which is just the difference per cell of LPPA, uh, um, as we discussed in the previous slides, and the Bayesian EB estimate of PPA. So for this one, we are looking at the difference per cell of how much he's scoring per attempt versus how much he's expected to score. So um, again, the, uh, the value of LSSE of the local version is that it can be mapped to show the spatial distribution. And then uh, I have points relative to league average, which is similar to, to Pola. Um, the name was a bit changed to, to make it easier uh, to understand. Points over, points over, but sometimes you can have negative values of, of Pola. So points relative to, to league average or Perla. Um, again, this is similar to the Pola, um, to the Pola statistic or metric um, introduced, by, by, introduced by Shortridge. Uh, it indicates basically the number of points a player scores above or below what is expected of him. Similar to SSE, positive values indicate a player is scoring more than expected, while negative values indicate the opposite. 
Similar again to SSE, it can be computed globally and locally. Uh, the global perla of player K is given by equation 12. It's simply the difference between the actual number of points he scores and the sum of the expected local points uh, across N. N being the number of cell, N being the cells where he attempts at least one field goal attempt. And then the local perla, L perla, is just uh, given by equation 13. It's simply the difference between the number of points a player scores in a cell versus the expected uh, number of points that he scores there. Um, something new that will be added in this research is the idea of the zonal SSE or zonal perla. So in shortage, they computed for the global and they also computed for the local. Um, in my research, I'll be using the spatial basis vectors found in the first part using NMF and then computing for um, computing for their zonal SSE and Perla values there. This measure can indicate how well a player is scoring from a shooting zone and uh, might be a better, um, a better metric, uh, which is in between a single value and a lot of values in the local version of, of SSE and Perla. Which leads me to the novelty of, of the methodology, really. There's, there's two main novelties uh, that this research will introduce. The first one is using PPA instead of field goal percentage in computing the EB estimate. As mentioned earlier, for shortage, they adopted uh, the EB estimate of field goal percentage to account for two uncertainties. One, the uncertainty of the positional accuracy uh, of the field goal data set. And the second one is the uncertainty in the estimated field goal percentage for cells with small sample samples or small number of attempts. This resulted in the EB estimated field goal percentage map that was smoother and less noisy. They then used that to compute for their version of SEC and POLA. However, um, field goal percentage is actually quite problematic, especially when you apply it to cells of a discretized score for the simple reason that field goal percentage does not account for the difference in points scored by a three-point and two-point field goal. This is not a problem if the shooting cells are homogeneous. Uh, that means only two-point or field goal or three-point field goals are present inside the cell. But if you encounter cells where there are both two-pointers and three-pointers, meaning they become non-homogeneous, uh, field goal percentage uh, fails a bit. So aside from that, when we use field goal percentage, it limits how we can divide the court. So we, we would need to be able to discretize the court in a way that um, that separates two pointers from three pointers so that they uh, we can have homogeneous shooting cells. But by using PPA, as in this study, we do away with all those limitations. It's a bit more elegant than, uh, than using field goal percentage. PPA inherently accounts for the difference between two pointers and three pointers by being a measure of points scored per attempt. So as a result, it, it makes the methodology more general. It's more generalizable and more applicable to any, any shooting cell size, regardless of whether or not the shooting cell that you have is homogeneous or non-homogeneous. The second uh, thing that will be added by this uh, research is the idea of the, um, of the zonal SSE and PERLA. So again, as I mentioned, aside from computing local and global metrics, we'll be computing these metrics from the shooting zones generated from NMF. This serves as a good in-between statistic between a single value, which can summarize performance over the entire uh, field goal distribution of a player, and the local metric or personal value, which is useful for showing the spatial distribution of the metric. The zonal SEC and PERLA can give us an idea of how well a player scores from different shooting zones. It can also be used to compare players with similar shooting habits if you've been able to group players based on their shooting tendencies in the, um, the spatial basis vectors. And that leads me to the um, final few parts of the presentation. The expected outputs, uh, a spatial data set of field goals, for UAP MBT season 81, 
spatial basis vectors that define um, the field goals in UAP MBT, including the methodology of how to extract these basis vectors, uh, a comparison of spatial characteristics of shooting for players, as well as the methodology for how to do that, uh, specifically focusing on uh, SSE, Perla, in both the local, global, and zonal uh, var variety. Of course, the maps and visualizations of, of field goals in UAP MBT. Um, so again, the data I've done that it's it's now it's available online, and people can can use that. I have some preliminary outputs for NMF, but I would still need to to check other methods to compute the optimal value of the number of bases. Again, I'm I'm looking at elbow method, but I'm also looking at uh, using the predictive likelihood uh, approach. Wherein, as I've mentioned, you remove 10% of the data, then you fit the independent LGCPs and MNF for varying values of, of the number of bases, and then look, looking at predictive performance. Um, the next steps is computing for SSE in Perla uh, computations and visualizations um, using the, the methodology that was presented, assessing the uh, and evaluate whether there's significant differences between the expected and observed values um, for, for SSE in Perla, especially for the EB estimated rate of DPA. Um, be able to compare a player, players based on their SSC and, and Perla values, rank them, visualize their, um, their, their shooting performance, but also analyze if the spatial metrics actually provide new information or if the information they provide are already captured by an existing conventional metric. So for this case, we will I'll try to look at um, how similar um, the spatial metrics are, or from an uh, already existing conventional uh, metric or statistic like effective field goal percentage, and of course validate as well if these uh, spatial metrics pass the sniff test by getting insights from players, coaches, managers, fans, uh, and others. So with that, uh, my proposed um, very pessimistic work schedule. Um, actually, it's an optimistic work schedule now. Um, is I've done with the literature review. I've, I'm done with the data. Um, and uh, I'm also done with the exploratory data analysis. I'm currently doing um, the code for the algorithms. Um, I'm looking at both Python and R uh, in terms of, in terms of, of, of these. And then doing some um, preliminary, preliminary, I'm doing some preliminary data analysis and visualization while also writing the manuscript. Um, thank you very much um, for for your time. Thank you for uh, for listening. And I, if you have questions, uh, please, I'm uh, feel free to to ask. And these are just some of the the references for um, for the study. Thank you, sir.